Hello, and welcome to New People, New Ways, a podcast in partnership with Fresh Expressions Florida and Fresh Expressions United Methodist that explores new ways of being the church through the stories and insights of scholars and practitioners alike. I'm Piper Ramsey Sumner. I'm a layperson and a cultivator of Fresh Expressions for the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church. And I'm Michael Adam Beck. I'm the director of Fresh Expressions UM and the director of Fresh Expressions Florida. And we are joined today by Dr. Leonard Sweet. Uh, Lynn really needs no introduction here, um, but he's a renowned preacher, teacher, a historical theologian, and theo uh, He's a prolific author, a professor to doctoral students at four different institutions, uh, including Drew University and George Fox University where I myself went and studied with Lynn to get a doctor, uh, in semio- doctorate in semiotics and future studies. Uh, and he is an expert in preaching, evangelism, ecclesiology, best known for his interests in church history, semiotics, and the future of uh, mission in the church. Um, and Lynn has shaped a whole generation of, uh, of leaders across the, the theological spectrum, really, but sp- for sure, in in the tribe called Methodist, um, including me and many others. So, Lynn, thank you so much for being here today and giving us your time and speaking in this conversation. My joy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I'm so glad we're here. This feels like a big deal. The Leonard Sweet is here with us. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> with, with my two dogs are sleeping, so I'm hoping they stay asleep. So. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, they can join in if they want to. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so our first big question that we always ask, um, which it can go in so many directions, which is what makes it fun. The question is, who is Leonard Sweet? Oh, my goodness. Who is Leonard Sweet? I am a follower of Jesus. My um, my theme song is um, it's actually uh, uh, an Indian song. Um, comes out of the mid-19th century when a a uh, family was being martyred, and the the head of the family. Um, this this is in Assam, which is in China. They call it South Tibet, but it's northeastern India. And as they were killing him and his family, he and and before that, they asked him to repent and ask him to uh, you know be an apostate and give up the faith. And all he could say is, "I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus." I have decided to follow Jesus, and and when that his last words were heard, they they made a song out of it, and we we now know it as kind of a little Sunday school ditty. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. So um, the story behind that, the story of martyrs, um, the difference between a maverick and a martyr is sometimes only three paces. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> All mavericks yeah. have to deal with, and we're all mavericks here, have to deal with that that threat of martyrdom. So it's a it's a song that has deep meaning. Um, I decided to follow Jesus, and that's basically who I am. My identity is found in Christ, and um, that's who I am. I love that, Lynn, and I love how you always call us back to uh, the person of Jesus, his living, glorious you know, resurrected, still wound-bearing self. And uh, I love really how you pushed against the whole leadership uh, uh, culture where it's all about leadership, leadership, and try to call us back to followership. But that's a whole other question uh, right now. And maybe you'll have a chance. That almost made me a martyr. (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking we were speaking. The the stones started coming, man, and they're still coming, but (laughs) I'm still standing. (laughs) Yeah. I was thinking, yeah, you were on the edge of that yourself, actually. Um, so uh, you were a pastor's kid, but but really more than that, actually, like your 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 mother was, uh, you know, a preacher and and in mother tongue, uh, you you really dig into that some. But you grew up in the faith and kind of going around with her. Actually, I just came, Lynn. I was in uh, West Virginia, all through the oh my mountains, goodness. and yeah. And working how, with how did Methodists. you ever leave? Uh-huh. <laughs> how, how, how did you ever leave? It's such a beautiful state. I miss it so much. Boy, oh boy. Yeah. I'm now out with the adolescent mountains of the the Rockies, the Canadian Rockies, you know, the American 
But those are adolescent mountains. The the mature mountains are those in West Virginia, the mountain mamas. And once they get into your bones, you can't you can't get them out. That's right. That's right. And everybody I talked to, like you were their claim to fame in West Virginia, even the Baptists, the Methodists, they're like, oh, yeah, Leonard Sweet, I'm here. <laughs> um, and I was mentioning you <laughs> in, the, in the gig. So, but yeah, so you, you kind of grew up with that upbringing. You can maybe talk to us a little bit about that. But then you had pe- a kind of a period where you went like atheist for a while, right? And, and yeah, and hardcore, what, yeah, hardcore uh, Marxist and Maoist had various uh, kind of atheist expressions and stages. Uh, about six years, I uh, I say I did some people sow wild oats. I pr- planted a prairie, and um, for six years I was uh, I was a real uh, apostate and proud of it. Um, yeah, yeah. So what what actually brought you back to the faith? Tell us about that journey. Well, this is where the whole concept of liminality comes in. I mean, I was, you know, I deconverted. That was my most powerful religious experience growing up. Um, I deconverted from the faith at 17. and and um, But I kept tracking with the river. I, I In my liminal stage, I kept tracking with it because I we were very poor and I needed money for everything. And so I still played the music at churches. I still played it with the organ. I still did weddings. I still did funerals. So I'm always still tracking with the church, even though I'm, um, I'm really, uh, hating it and despising my upbringing. And, but I couldn't escape it because I needed the money. So, and then, uh, in my, in the course of my journey, you know, I'm reading everybody, every, all the number one atheists. I, I went to, um, and I, this was in Indianapolis, um, a, one of the introducers of Eastern religion. He was kind of the chief guru of yoga. Uh, his name was Baba Ram Das, And mm-hmm. he and Timothy Leary were professors. His name was Richard Alpert, but he died just a few years ago, like 2019. But he was giving a, a, a speech in um, the, the major, um, uh, kind of place where they have public lectures in, in Indianapolis. And so I went by myself. I sat in the back row, just kind of see what 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 he would have to offer. And I'll never forget, he, so he spent the first 10 minutes when he came out, not saying a word, just getting his space right. It was kind of a living room setting, and he'd arrange the pillows. And, and then when he got his space right, then he went to this little altar he had set up, and he, he got out a, 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 a kneeler. And he lit some candles and did some incense. And he got out of a picture of his uh, of his guru. And he knelt down and lit some candles and said a prayer to his guru. And uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm telling you, <laughs> Piper, Michael, everybody follows somebody. Everybody follows. Even if you're following yourself, you're still following somebody. You, if you put yourself at the center of the universe, you 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 say, "I'm going to author my own story. Um, I'm going to be my own authority." You're still following somebody. You're following you. So everybody follows somebody, and of course, that you is shaped by culture and everything else. And so it just hit me: if you can find me any better person to follow than Jesus, I'll listen. But. It was just a real, all that, all my, my upbringing came back and I realized what I'd done. I repented and, and I just, um, so I became hardcore. Let me tell you, I was, when you return to the river, you kind of return with pure water, you know, you get rid of all the toxins. And I had 17 years and of toxins in my system of growing up in this hardcore fundamentalist, um, almost Amish like, uh, setting. And, um, so that's how, that's how I came back. I just, it just, that moment when he spent all that time, I came to hear him, but he's there giving homage and devotion to his, his Eastern guru. And it just hit me. Everybody follow somebody and Mm -hmm. I'm going to follow Jesus. So, Mm. so, so just for our, our listeners today that maybe don't know a little bit about your upbringing with your mom, uh, Mabel, and, and kind of just give us a quick snapshot of what that was like growing up. 
<laughs> I well, want to I want to hop in real quick though because I put that question in because I myself am a pastor's kid and I actually have a podcast that I you? have yeah I kind of put it on hiatus and I'm coming back to it where called pastor's kid where I interview yeah. pastor's kids growing yeah, up and yeah. they talk about their well that's cool yeah talk about yeah. their experience and reflect on all of the we talk a lot about that process of um, you grow up in this certain environment. And then when you have that chance in adulthood, a lot of people will woo, go as far, you know, far away from, you know, the apple falling from the tree as far as you can. And then a lot of people tend yeah. to roll back um, in their own way. And the because they, yeah, yeah they yeah. find those things <laughs> at the heart of the religion that they were taught and yeah. that was instilled yeah. in them and they find their way back. Yeah, and it partly was music that brought me back too. Um, the music of the church, the hymnody, the, the gospel music. But Piper, there's there's PKs, but we also we also forget the MKs, the missionary kids. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole other category uh, of people you might want to consider, uh, you know, interviewing too. The MKs. Um, but yeah, I was a PK, but the P the preacher in my house was my mother, and she was ordained in this very small tribe i call them the marine corps of methodism they were called pilgrim holiness mm -hmm. and um they looked just like amish you couldn't bob your hair you couldn't wear any jewelry you showed no skin um it was um and at age five we had to start memorizing 12 bible verses a week um this is a lot like the bet safer that a jewish child went through uh beginning at age six um my mother homeschooled us in Christianity, but she public schooled us uh, at the same time. So we went to the public school, but we also got homeschooled in in Christianity. And and um, my mother's motto was, "I'm not going to isolate you, but I am going to insulate you." Okay, and she provided <laughs> some deep um, deep insulation, some deep padding. Um, but yeah, we mm. we we had to get a, a doctor's excuse not to dance in gym. Um, even though they were square dancing, it, this was against our religion. And, um, mm -hmm. the only way the school would, it, would allow it is that we had a doctor's excuse. So she found a physician. I don't know where she found him, but who wrote a prescription, um, that got us out of, um, uh, dancing. So it was, a, it was very, yeah. My father was, he was a little more liberal. He was free Methodist. Um, but, um, so it was, but it was very hardcore Wesleyan. And, um, so that's, um, yeah, we, my mother got defrocked from the pilgrims cause my father gave her a wedding ring and, and they, they brought up in charges of worldliness. And so she got defrocked and, when, and then she got defrocked again by the free Methodists cause my father brought it into our home at when I was nine, the devil's blinking box. And that was television. So that's how mm. I became a Methodist. We just kept getting kicked out of all the, <laughs> yeah, all the the best churches in town and the Methodists will take anybody. Yeah. And, um, so, so we, uh, that's how I, that was my upbringing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tell, I tell the story a lot of it in this book that you mentioned. Thank you for remembering it, Michael, this book on, uh, mother tongue, which is what it's like to grow up in this kind of hardcore fundamentalist, uh, environment. Yeah. It's only, I, I it's only hope girls. I did it without a lot of, I, I really have a lot of appreciation for a lot of it. So mm -hmm. I, um, I'm, I, I was, I think able to, there's not a lot of uh, bitterness or resentment in there. I don't think, mm -hmm. um, I hope it's basically generosity and appreciation. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the church of the Nazarene. So it was a very like light version of that. Hold yeah, you're right. Holiness you're, movement, you're but not liberal. As uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. you were the way, way out there liberals. Yeah. When I, was going up, yeah. I did. I had heard about the um, about the wedding ring thing. That was a controversy for a while with the Nazarenes, but they kind of settled yeah. down by the time I was around. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the um, things about the Fresh Expressions movement is that it's basically brand new in the grand scheme of the history of the church. Um, so in your like study of culture and specifically how the church kind of fits into that, why do you think Fresh Expressions as a movement has grown so quickly into what it is now? What attracts people to it and why does it work? I think one thing is it's, uh, it's a renewal movement um, that is trying to renew the church, not, um, you know, revolt from the church or 
it, it loves the church. So it's a lover's quarrel with the church. And I think people sense that. Uh, yeah. They sense there needs to be a critique. We need to do some new things. But they're still basically, and that's partly because of Michael's spirit, I think, at least in the U.S. There's this deep love for for the church. Um, I think, too, the people are, are realizing that um, for much of the church, the future is coming. What, and you, I don't even know if you even know what this means. By or COD. You ever hear that phrase? COD. When I was growing up, it means cash on delivery. Okay. Well, they would deliver something well, to, your, to your house, but they wouldn't give it to you until you paid for it. But f- the COD of today is change or die. Um, hmm. The future is coming, COD, change or die. And so there's this theology of change that in, I mean, anything that's alive is changing. That's the very definition of death is a body that doesn't change. So when you stop changing, you die. When you, when you keep changing, you, you're alive. And so it's very simple. It's COD. It's change or die. And Fresh Expressions is providing a, a model and, and modes of change that are um, faithful to the, the tradition, but allow for all sorts of innovation and, and, uh, and uh, entrepreneurship and, and imagination. So I think people are realizing that, uh, that it is, we are in a COD cha- uh, mode. And, um, and there's also, you know, the, the Bible has this wonderful phrase, God's mercy, God's mercies are fresh every morning. Okay. Hmm. And so much of the church is stale, you know, it's just so stale it, and it, it, it leaves you with this sense of blandness and, 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 and the stale air and the, you, you walk into some church, you can smell death in them. I mean, you, they just give off the odor. Of, uh, of of a decay and and so people are I think really hungry for for fresh um, for those fresh mercies that come to us every morning and I think it just in the title fresh expressions captured that so I think there's a lot of reasons but it's just a couple that come to mind quickly Thank you for that, Lynn, and thank you for and your own ministry and teaching, and um, you've always kind of held those things together too, right? To love and the tradition and see the value in it, but also to call the church out um, to, uh, you know, experiment and do things in fresh ways. And um, I actually, just a little side note, um, you took us over to England as part of your uh, doctoral education in semiotics and future studies, so we got to spend time in Cambridge and Oxford and um really get get us some firsthand um you know experience into where where the whole thing started and there's been some uh like conversation around the language um of pioneering some people have struggled with that there's been suggestion of like pilgriming some of those metaphors really helpful some of them have colonial connections connotations that but you've suggested um using advent and um, the the kind of theology and the depth of, of that tradition to suggest maybe adventuring is is a good language for what we're doing in fresh expressions. Can you say a little bit about that? Um, when I suggested, I didn't think anybody take it seriously, but you did. So, <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm 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 grateful. I you know take it and run with it. But I, I love the word advent. Um, I mean, partly an advent is the arrival of of some of an epiphany, of a revelation, of something that's that's um, fresh that you didn't create. That's why I love Advent over Invent. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's something that we that's a gift in some ways, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it it surprises us and it it um, it ambushes us and. Um, and that's the, of course, the ultimate advent is Emmanuel, God with us. So those moments of withness of God's presence and the divine. And so I just, so the, ad, the word adventurer is somebody on that journey, um, that, that, that journey of advent. And so just all of a sudden, let's, let's claim the backstory of that word adventure, uh, turning it into a, you know, a noun. And um, let's. Let's see um, if that may be another way for us to think, especially for us expressions, is trying to get people to, to open themselves up 
um, to put in some new, new fresh air into the room to get rid of a lot of the, the stale air that's there. So I, I, I was thinking the other day, and it, this is a T.S. Eliot line in one of his, in his uh, Wasteland poem, but, uh, or is it for, I, I forget which one it is, but he, um, he talks about, you know, I love the word fair, farewell, uh, because at, ultimately um, what Jesus did on the cross, we have, the, we translate the word sozo as save, but in the Greek, it really means heal, health and wholeness. And Jesus provided us wholeness and wellness and, and, um, and healing on the cross, the healing of our brokenness and the restoration of our, our humanity. So, um, so I love that fair, it comes out, of course, fair thee well. And we got, we, we abbreviate it to fair well, which means you're wishing people wellness. You're wishing people health. But T.S. Eliot added to it, he goes, farewell, but also fair forward, voyagers. Mm -hmm. And I love that, you know, if we could kind of begin wishing one another farewell, but fair forward. The purpose of wellness is not just wellness itself. The purpose of wellness is to move into this future, to fare forward, to, to move uh, where God is already uh, pulling us and calling us to, to join him. So, um, so I, I'm going to start saying from now, fare forward as well as farewell as a, <laughs> as a closing, uh, fair forward. That's good. That's good. And, you know, um, it was Bernard of Clairvaux back in thousand years ago or so, uh, who, who had that great, um, in one of his sermons line about the three comings of Christ, you know, in the flesh in Bethlehem today coming afresh in our hearts, our lives, uh, and coming again at the end of time to heal and consummate all things and bring the new creation. And so adventuring, like we're not inventing, we're adventing, we're working right. with God's listing material and how Jesus is breaking afresh into the world today, right now, and there having um, insight uh, around that. But then one of my favorite things about your teaching and your spirit is this future orientation. And like the rope of hope that God has thrown us from the future. And we're holding on to that, right? And we're, we're pulling through the storms of life. But God's already revealed this future and it's breaking into the world now. And so adventuring kind of captures all of that. It does, really. Yeah, yeah. it really does. If you pack it, if you unpack it right. Yeah. 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 And adventural forms of church. I just love that language. But tell us, what's the difference between um, doing church and being church? For you, well, there's a um, when I hear church, I hear body of Christ. So um, the ultimate is to be the body of Christ, and I mean that in both both senses. But the body of Christ will do what the body of Christ does. So you really can't separate them. But but there is this first. Uh, this little phrase in Christ is used. I, I, I get different counts when I count them, but basically around 216 times in the New Testament. Um, and it always has to be in Christ. It always has this individual and communal component. So the whole, the whole, you know, message of the gospel is that I know there's a, Colossians 2, but I can't get past Colossians 1. The secret that has been kept hidden has now been revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In, other, in you, as a, as a follower, as a disciple, as an adventurer, but in you as, as the body, as the, as the body of Christ. So it is, so there's no, there's no distance here. That's the only problem with that follower metaphor. There's a, there's a sense of distance, and there is no distance as Christ dwells um and we share this is the radical revolutionary nature of what what jesus did for us on the cross we and what he did for us in, in that blowing out of that uh, that tomb he wants to live his resurrection life in and through us by us i mean ourselves as the temple but also as the church as the as the new temple of his of his body 
So he is, I mean, that's how he lives. I mean, I don't you ever, you must have learned this one, Piper. Uh, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living no matter what they say. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he lives. How do I know he lives? He lives within my heart. He He's alive. He's two places at once. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father with his wounds, interceding for our wounds. Uh, through the power of his wounds, he intercedes for our brokenness. And, and um, so he's there. He's ascended at the right hand of the Father, but he's also alive, not just there interceding for us, but he is living his resurrection life in and through us. So that's what it means to be the body of Christ. I mean, to be Christ. I mean, it, this is not, this is, um, this is a radical notion that this is the word Christian, little Christ. That's what it means. There's only one big J, but we're all little J's. And mm-hmm. what does it mean that he wants to live his resurrection life in and through us? I mean, this is, Un- but this is dr- truly good news. We've, we've, this is the, the good news of the gospel. Uh, it's not that we can be like him. I hate that doctrine of Christ's likeness. No, 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 no. Uh, oh, to be like him. That's another one where you may have remembered singing Piper. Uh, oh, to be like him. No, no, no. No, we, we're, this is an unworthy ambition for a, a follower of Jesus. He is not to be like him. I mean, it is to allow the spirit, which is always about the spirit of Christ and brings Christ to life in each one of us. So, so that we can literally be his body in the world, be the hmm. temple, his, his temple and the church be that temple as well. So you can't separate from me, the individual, and the communal, me and we, you flip me over, you get we, so you got to have both. And so the ultimate thing is, what does it mean for the church to be Christ, to be his body. Uh, and then mm-hmm. after the being comes the doing, which issues from the being. Um, so you do, you do Christ, but first you be Christ. Um, and you, he, we serve a risen Lord, but we serve a rising Lord as he continues to rise in each one of us. Uh, so it's risen and rising, uh, yeah. a rising, a rising savior. Yeah, yeah. And before Piper jumps in here on the um, next question. So all of that, you know, your focus on Sozo Jesus healing, being Christ rather than trying to be like him, um, where where that kind of finds communal embodiment in the Fresh Expressions movement is we're shifting that focus around. Um, how do we be Christ in community together in a tattoo parlor, in a dog park, yeah, exactly. in a VR space, you know, uh, it, wherever? Um, so it, it really is shifting that to thinking the presence of Jesus can live through us in all right. of those spaces where historically we thought, oh, we got to get people in a room and then we can, you know, the presence of Jesus will fill the room or whatever. This is more we're going to go join Jesus out in the world. He's already there before we get there. And he his life lives through us in those places. And so church kind of springs up from every nook and cranny of life. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's and this is a radical shift in people's thinking, though, Michael, is to because most people have the idea that we take Jesus out into the world. Like yeah. we stuff Jesus in our backpack and take him out there like a football and pass him around. You know, no, no, no. <laughs> Before yeah. we ever got there, he was already there up to something, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why the founder of our tribe, John Wesley, he the number one thing for him is do no harm. First of all, it's. It's, you know, the number one in the Hippocratic Oath, but for him, it made, it was all about evangelism and mission. You do no harm, first of all. And we have, we have roughed it. We've rushed in there, roughed somebody up because they're not what we think we are. And we've harmed the Holy Spirit. We've really hamstrung the Holy Spirit from doing what the Holy Spirit was already doing before we got there. So true evangelism is not show and tell. It's shut up and listen. You know, you you got to have mm-hmm. a listening ear. We got to be good listeners to t- to somebody else's story to what's going on in that tattoo parlor, so that so that that the Christ that is already there can continue to reach full stature, mm-hmm. uh, as as Paul put it. Mm. Wow, I love that. That's one of the best things about fresh expressions, and why I 
of all the different methods and approach to doing church in specifically missionally that what keeps me with fresh expressions is that listening is the first thing you have to listen to where God is speaking and what God is up to, but also to the people. If you're going to try, like you're speaking of missions, that's my biggest critique of missions is that it, it has for so long been for a lot of people and a lot of traditions, a uh, kind of a colonizing mission where they come and they just try to make everybody look like them. And then all of a sudden there are the people that are all across the world that dress like Americans because American missionaries show up and try to um, tell them this is what, this is what a good Christian looks like and talks like and acts like instead of it being contextual and reflecting the people that live there. And then also the people that live there being a part of the story of shaping it and the wisdom that they have themselves to contribute and also to teach you as a leader or as somebody who is bringing this message. Hmm. That's why I don't like the word transform. I try not to use it. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the word transfigure rather than transform because I mean, this is what missionaries have done. Wherever they've gone, they've gone and they say, okay, I'm here to tell you the gospel and to transform your culture. Okay. I guarantee you that the culture that they have the idea that will be, that will issue and be the result of that transformation will look like them. Transformation is ultimately has this colonialist concept and component to it. You can't get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Because transformation is outside in, transfiguration is inside out. As you become, as you know, we become new creatures in Christ. You know, tadpoles become a whole new creature. I mean, the difference between a tadpole and a frog. I mean, the difference between a caterpillar and a butterfly. They are transfigured. We become new creatures in Christ, and wherever you know the gospel is planted, truly. There's not just transformation, which comes up looking like I think it ought to look, but it's become something new. So there's new features of Christ I've never seen before that are in this new new creation now, in this new new culture. And there's certain things about Jesus I will never know until Jesus is transfigured into, uh, incarnated into, contextualized into a tattoo parlor. I mean, you know. Or whatever that culture is, um, so so you're exactly right. There is this, and that's my that's my critique of that word transform. You can I've never seen anybody who's used it that hasn't had that still that colonial component. That the ultimate what will result from this transformation will look something like me. Mm-hmm. It'll sound something like me. It'll be something like me. And no, it if it's truly Jesus, it won't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it won't. Yeah, because she's all about a new thing. So there's going to be something. There's going to be a, a, an advent here. Mm. Um, so yeah. I like that. Speaking of context, you and Michael wrote a book together called Contextual Intelligence. So can maybe both of you jump in and explain what that means and why contextual intelligence is an important thing to do while engaging in these missional forms of ministry and community building. Well, we can come at it from a couple of angles. One is, uh, you know, in the real estate business, business, it's location, location, location. And in in the, I think in the um, church business, it's context, context, context. And you have to know your context. The, the, the inspiration for it, in some ways, at least for our initial uh, kind of, attraction towards it was this book that was published um what 15 years ago um by the the dean at harvard business school and i'm not a big you know business guy uh corporate literature for the church um but it was it was called in their times and so i that that's what gave me the the that has biblical resonance with the title and the guy's name is Nitin Noria, and uh, his his co-author, Noria was the dean at the business school. Um, they studied the hundred, supposedly the hundred best businesses, corporate leaders of the 20th century, and what could we find that they all share in common? And they did all these multifactorial analysis and put all the statistics into computers. 
And um, they found basically five leadership styles, they called it. But each, each style was different. And you could be as effective being a quiet managerial type as you could be a charismatic. But the only thing they could find that tied everybody together, and they started with a thousand, got it down to a hundred, was, and this is the phrase that they used, these were people that knew their times and then knew what to do. Well, that's right out of the Bible. Once again, the world steals our best lines. That's, you know, Chronicles 12, 32. Mm-hmm. And um, the the tribe of Issachar are the ones that knew their times and knew what to do. And and Jesus called us, you know, you know how to read the signs of the sky. You, know, you need to know how, know how to read the signs of the time. So the ability to read your context, um, to know your context, whatever those times are, they found was the key requirement for success in the corporate world. And I go, well, you know, again, we should already know this because it's in our stuff. It's in our story. If we know our story well enough, we could have written that book before they did. Um, So Michael and I just kind of tried to reclaim for the church, the origin story of that in their times and what it means to know their times, what it means to have contextual intelligence. And uh, so that was our initial um, kind of inspiration. You want to take it from there, Michael? Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in a little bit on it. And Piper, it comes back another angle on this is exactly what you said, like how the church has gotten mission wrong across history. So there's like the replacement model of mission, go in and wipe out everyone and supplant, you know, plant Christian culture, supposedly. Right. And I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to get Lynn riffing off that. But, um, yeah, you t- <laughs> then, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And there, there's like the ennoblement model. Uh, back yeah. to Len's point about transforming. We're going to go in and ennoble and enlighten all these other cultures to look like Euro tribal, whatever. And actually, what Jesus, the gospel, the heart of it is, is is him taking on flesh, him taking on particularity to redeem universally. Um, Jesus didn't just love people in general. He loved particular persons, particular names, particular stories, particular... Um, and, and through that, you know, healed, healed the whole universe. So contextual intelligence is about listening to our context. It's what Lynn said, like speaking a lot less, listening a lot more. It's about trying to really understand and be present in what's happening and then let transfiguration like happen rather than we're going out trying to transform and stuff. But so contextual forms of church that speak the language of the people. I think one of the things we picked up on that book, too, is how Wesley in that idea is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. John Wesley was like, plain truth for plain people, right? Yeah. Oh, people aren't coming to church. Let me go out to the field and preach there. And then, oh, people go to work at 4 a.m. So let me go out and do the, the 5 a.m. you know worship preaching gathering, which he said was the glory of the method. So this idea of like knowing the context, understanding the context and knowing what to do. Um, to how to, you know, uh, reach people and share the gospel in the world. I think that's uh, one of the key ideas behind it. It's good. And the, go and grab your copy. the amazing thing about Wesley, yeah, I was just going to say the amazing thing about Wesley, he was an Oxford Don. I mean, he yeah. he was uh, an academic superstar. Um, and for him, he was willing to adjust to the context even to the point where one day, and he's the one who started field preaching. I mean, he'd go out in the fields. Can you imagine Wesley and all of his academic garb? And, and he goes out. <laughs> and, and his his phrase was, as he kind of said, well, I guess it's time to get more vile. And yeah. that was his phrase. <laughs> Just get, I got to get more vile. I got to learn it. And that, that was, I mean, it, it, he didn't want to do this. He didn't, but he, he knew he needed to do this. You got to implant the gospel in in the the content in the soil of where you are so even if it meant for an academic uh superstar in oxford don quote what in the eyes of the academia was to get vile um he was going to do it and jesus himself they, they it says in the scriptures the common people heard him gladly you know he was willing to get common to communicate in in the commoner's language and and he he whatever that context was um so, yeah, context is, I mean, Jesus is king, but context is queen, maybe. 
So, yeah. It's good. I like that. King and queen. <laughs> so um, our last big question, um, which we've been asking everybody. So where do you see the future of Christianity and the church heading? Oh, well, that, that takes another, you know, <laughs> it's, it's going to be heading in many directions. Um, I, I don't, um, I don't know exactly where to, where to begin. I, the, we're, we're talking about a church also forming in the multiverse and, um, that's a whole other conversation. It's going to be. I think in China you got an above ground and a underground uh, church. We're we're going to have a, a physical church, but we're also going to have a virtual church. And we've got a Jesus will be Lord of the metaverse, and we need to proclaim him Lord of the metaverse and not be afraid of incarnating the gospel in this whole new um, new world that's um, that's out there. As Michael knows, we were one of the first in our doctoral program to um, have classes in Second Life. Um, and we did this right after Second Life started. So this is like, you know, 2000, um, what, and five and six and seven. So it's, this is you know, a long time ago. Um, and everybody there was in an av- was had an avatar and their avatar um, um, was how they negotiated various campuses. We had a, a water campus, a, a desert campus and a mountain campus and any rate. Um, so I think partly the future is going to be um, both um, and we, and we need to develop an ecclesiology of the metaverse of, of virtual, the virtual church um, and not make it second class. Well, that's not the real church. No, it, it will be real church and it, it, it needs to be seen as, as real church. Um, I also think we are in for some um, for some times of uh, persecution. Um, increasingly, uh, you don't have to worry about this in Florida, but I live in the Pacific Northwest. I teach in the Northeast. Um, the cultures there are not just post-Christian; they are anti-Christian. I mean, if you say you are Christian, you will pay in one way or another. So we we've got to learn a whole new way of being good guests in a culture, in a pagan culture with many, many gods. And, um, and how do we serve faithfully, uh, in that, in that culture where, um, there are many gods and people are open to many gods and least open to your God. Okay. So there's gotta be a whole new mentality for, uh, for the church. Um, um, this year, I'm having as my conversation partner at my my water advance here on Orcus, um, which is just preceding the future church think tank. Um, somebody I can't give his name because he's helping to plant churches in North Korea, China, uh, Vietnam, some of the most inhospitable places for for churches today. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's sh- he's showing us how you can. Um, be a guest in these cultures and still proclaim Jesus in a way in which uh, the gospel can be, can be heard. So I'm really excited to hear him and to um, receive his, his counsel. Uh, Cause I think this is the future. Um, we, we no longer have the home court advantage. They're all away games. The crowds are not cheering for the Christians. They're saying you had your chance, sit down, shut up. You blew it. Um, give everybody else to say, we don't want to hear a word from you. And um, now you've got this countervailing force of, well, let's, let's bring back this Christian nation, this Christian culture as if we ever had it. But, um, uh, but that's, that's, um, that's a recipe for uh, oblivion actually. Um, so what, what does it mean for us to, to understand the context, which is um, this is a, this is a whole new world um and it's a world where a uh, world that jesus loves but it's much more like the first century than the 20th century um we're back into the kind of climate that the church was born in uh, which was not hospitable to to the faith 
and we had to learn to deal with that. So, yeah. so Lynn, tell tell our listeners and our viewers um, what are some of the the newest projects you're working on. Where can people connect with you, follow you? Um, tell us about your YouTube channel. Uh, like, <laughs> I yeah, I just. Follow- <laughs> yeah, I just started uh, opening it up to uh, everybody now. It's um, it's uh, my 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 Len talks I call them, and we I have 140 of them now. Can you believe it? It one a week uh, for 140 weeks. Um, just to show you how to do semiotic readings of lectionary. So it's lectionary based, but um, I do I do semiotics with lectionary passages. So that's Len talk on YouTube, my own YouTube channel. I have a, a pod, my own podcast called Napkin Scribbles. Um, right now, we're looking at hymns that the church would 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 be uh, at a loss if we lost. Um, so, um, mm-hmm. and then um, then I of course my Facebook is where I do kind of a little blog every other day or something. And so I do these my blogs. I do micro blogs on Twitter. So. Yeah, if you if you just start um, looking at Len Suite, then um, there are a lot of ways for us to connect. The, the big project I'm working on now is is a book I've been working on for 20 years called A Jesus Human. And uh, Michael hmm. knows about that one because I I had his class read a read a little bit of it, and it's a it comes with a tandem book, uh, Designer Jesus, which shows you how to live. What does it mean to live a as a Jesus human? But the the notion that Jesus is the last Adam that restored us to our place as as true humans, and um, this is a big discussion right now because you got the number one theologian, arguably in the world from the Eastern tradition, David Bentley Hart, has a new t- new book called "You Are Gods." I mean, I, I thought I was reading Shirley MacLaine, <laughs> I mean, a New Age. <laughs> you are gods no we were not created so i'm i'm trying to give an alternative voice um here to um but you can't be human without the divine but god did not create us as divine god created us as human which is huge uh and jesus shows us how to be human restored that true humanity so can we we can live now out of our full humanness uh, in a world that is lost any understanding of what it means to be human so that should be out early next year so thank you for asking now now i'm extra excited that sounds awesome um and to our listeners thank you so much for joining in on this episode of new people new ways if you enjoyed this conversation with leonard sweet don't forget to rate review subscribe and share it we are available on any platform that you want to listen through Uh, If you would like to learn more about Fresh Expressions, you can check out freshexpressionsfl.org. And then we're also Fresh Expressions Florida on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all those places. And with that, we will see you next time on New People, New Ways.